thanks to professors Jing Hidalgo Pantoja, Ralph Seminogalan, Jack Wigley, and all at the USD Center for Creative Writing and Literary Studies for inviting me to give this talk. I am very honored and grateful to you for including me in your literary family. This talk gives me the opportunity to celebrate my book, Selected Short Stories, which was recently uh, released by the University of Santo Tomas Publishing House. The book collects 39 of what I think are my strongest and most interesting short fiction. The book is divided into three parts. Part one includes stories set in my mythical place, Ubek, Ubek, which is a lot like Cebu. Part two has stories from other parts of the Philippines. And part three, many of which are more recent stories, are set in other parts of the world, including the United States where I live, Mexico, France, India, Peru, other places. These places have interested me. To give you an idea of my writing, I'd like to share a short reading from part two of my selected short stories, a story entitled Romeo. The piece recalls the puppy that I bought in Escota when I was in college. My niece and I saw a man holding out puppies for sale and on a whim, I bought one and named it Romeo. I believe we were studying, studying Shakespeare. Um, this story is about that beloved dog, but it's also about my mother. And it's also about the bitter and difficult Marcos years in Manila that my mother had to endure. I'm reading from the last part of the story. Um, so I'm reading from selective short stories. What the dog wants most of all is for my mother to touch him, rub the fur on his back. His fur is clean. A neighbor woman comes in every Saturday to clean the house and to wash him using a strong bar of sulfur soap to kill his fleas and ticks. He loves the feel of the woman's strong hands working the soap through his thick fur and the gushing of cold water down his back makes him moan. He never barks, he never whimpers, but he stands perfectly still near the garden hose which the woman uses to wash him. But he rarely feels the touch of my mother's hands. And so in the early mornings while she's hanging her clothes to dry, he makes it a point to do his rounds so he'll brush against her legs. And then she's, she says, go, Romeo, sit down. But sometimes she talks some more. I heard the children playing and I forgot and thought they were mine. I forgot that they've grown and are gone, but they'll come home. They always do, they'll be back. And the sound of my mother's voice echoes in Romeo's mind, creating strange longings, yearnings for wild, wide fields and open skies, which he has never seen. By the time my brother told me about Romeo's death, my brother was drinking. He liked brandy and preferred Napoleon. He could grow through a hundred dollar bottle in three days. The day after I got in from the States, we went shopping at the duty-free shop so he could stack up on his, stock up on his brandy. He was drinking brandy that afternoon. We were sitting on the veranda between the old house and his house. During the first glasses of brandy, he talked about Cory hiding in a Carmelite convent in Cebu during the Edsa people power revolution and the dramatic fall of Marcos. But with his fourth drink, he talked about our mother, about Romeo's death in particular. Romeo couldn't get up, he said. He'd been dying for several days before mama finally called and asked me to go to Manila. He was lying on that dirty mat and he could barely move, but he wagged his tail when he saw me. The typhoon season was starting and he was constantly wet. I told mama we had to call the vet. She didn't want to put him to sleep. She insisted he just had a cold. We argued for a long time until I finally convinced her that a vet could give him medicine to make him feel better. 
She was in her bedroom when the vet arrived. She was looking at a dress catalog. I was with Romeo when the vet gave him a shot. I didn't even know he died. He had a peaceful death. My brother and I recalled how good-natured Romeo had always been, how willing to please, and how as a puppy he looked so much like a German shepherd, but that as he grew older, his legs grew lanky, his chest filled out while his rear remained lean, so his shape was more like a dingo, but he was always big and always sounded fierce, just like a German shepherd. I told my brother how happy Romeo had been to see me as a grown woman with my firstborn son. This was back in 1972, right around the time of the Plaza Miranda bombing. It was as if the years had not passed between us. And he had jumped into my arms and licked my face. And he wagged his tail as he stared curiously at my son. He was terribly polite when my son yanked his tail. All he did was whimper and turn to look for my mother. It was clear to me then that it was my mother whom he now loved. I had become some kind of pleasant memory, one he cherished, but I was no longer part of his life. I was no longer part of the universe of that garage and backyard in our Malate house. There's one more thing long before Romeo died on Monday morning at 5.30 in the morning, my mother picks up her bra, slip and dress, which she had worn on Sunday. In the semi-darkness, she makes her way down the wooden stairs. Romeo hears her and he quickly stands up from his mat and races to the kitchen door. He wags his tail expectantly as he listens to my mother picking up the plastic basin and filling this with water at the kitchen sink. She drops her clothes into the basin, sprinkles tied over them, and proceeds to wash them. Romeo hears all of this, and his heart is beating fast, and he stands by the kitchen door waiting, waiting. At last, before the sun is up, the, doors, the door opens, and my mother, with basin in her hands, steps out into the small backyard. Romeo looks up rushes to her, jumps up, and whines his greeting. Down, Romeo, she says, pushing him away. Undeterred, he wags his tail and starts his patrol of the small backyard. Round and round he goes, and the dripping from the clothes fall on Romeo's back as he does his rounds of the seven feet by 30 backyard. And then, and then, as he squeezes past my mother, he brushes up against her legs, and then my mother reaches out to touch him. Come here, good dog, Romeo, good dog. You're all I have now, she says. The sun is up and it's morning finally when Romeo licks her hand and shivers with delight. So that is from my story, Romeo. Um, for this talk, Ralph and Jack have sent me questions. Thank you, Ralph and Jack. And I will start by responding to Ralph's first question. So he goes, which writers, Filipino and foreign, have influenced your fictional writing the most in terms of thematic concerns and literary style? OK, Ralph, here's your answer. When I was learning the craft of writing stories, I read the classics, some of which I had read in college and which I reread with interest. I wanted to learn how the writers put their stories together, how they created interesting and fleshed out characters. I observed how they handled dialogue, plot, setting, and other elements of fiction writing. I noted their elegant language, how they strung their words together and phrases. I wondered how an artful writer and one who wrote simply could be equally effective. Aside from looking to these writers for tips on how to write better, I was trying to find an answer to an important question that was in my head. What is writer's voice? What is writer's voice? How was it that Graham Greene's work could not be mistaken as the work by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, for example? There is a bit of background related to this question of voice. 
When I started writing stories, I didn't have a strong handle on voice. Even though I could create stories, they had a somewhat generic feel to them, so much so that once I was told by a workshopper that my work could have been written by a graduate from Sacred Heart College in New York, a critique that stunned me since I was born and raised in the Philippines. I had to stop and think about the problem. It took a while, but once I had pinpointed that my voice was off, I studied the fine writers to see how they conveyed their own writing voices. I also observed how these writers, writers handle style, language, character, and character development, conflict, plot, and all the nuances that go into fiction writing. My best teachers and writer's voice were the ones whose works I read in translation, in translated English. Gustave Flaubert, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Fyodor Dostoevsky. Think of this. Their works were originally written in another language. I read the English translation of their works. And yet I knew I was reading work by a French or Russian or Latin American. I was able to pick out their unique writing voices. I could tell I was reading Flaubert, not Dostoevsky, for instance. How did they accomplish that? I figured it had to do with their setting, with the characters that were authentic to those particular places, their conflicts, their culture, their values. And I always felt some presence of the writers right there on the page. And so I could not confuse work by Marquez with work by another writer. My teacher for dialogue was Graham Greene. If you want to learn how to write good dialogue, read Green and note that his dialogue is never shallow. Every sentence uttered reveals something about the character speaking. Gustave Flaubert taught me how to create and develop characters. If you think about it, Madame Bovary could have been a cheap romance novel, imagine, but it's a classic. So how did Flaubert accomplish that? By creating complex and memorable characters. There is another thing that Flaubert taught me about characters. Sometimes characters you are creating are very similar. Um, I believe it was he who said, it's like seeing white on white. So the fiction writer's job is to differ differentiate, differentiate the colors somehow. In other words, the writer has to dig deep, to dig deep to be able to differentiate one character from another. Still another writer who influenced me a lot was our, our own writer, Lina Espina Moore. She reinforced my ideas about voice. Lina had a very distinct Cebuana flavor in her stories. She was a Cebuana like me and she had novels and short stories written in English and Visaya. I knew her, she was a friend of my mother and she took me under her wing, she mentored me. I remember her telling me that she used to dash off stories for publication to help pay for the school tuition fees of nephews and nieces that she helped support. She used to give me advice such as, write like you talk, die, write like you talk. Well, it's not exactly that way for me, but I understood what she meant. She meant, don't be maarte, don't be pretentious, just write like you talk. I also reread Jose Rizal, not just a study for the Filipino voice, but to see how he handled the historical aspect of his novels. He wrote about character, characters whose lives were shaped by historical events. Rizal's characters had internal as well as external conflicts to deal with. I could see that his characters had to react to the historical events that, that was happening, that were ongoing, that in fact, their lives were shaped by these historical events. I should uh, mention one other uh, influence on my writing, and these were Philippine epics. Here in California, the folklorist Herminia Menez created a folklore study group associated with UCLA. 
I had read Homer in college, but I had no idea that we had our own Philippine epics. Our little group worked on transliterated manuscripts, which were actually difficult to read, but I was so enchanted to learn about our own gods and goddesses of our own river of the dead, something like the river Styx. Lam Ang, Agyu, Tua Ang, Beibuyan, these epic heroes found their way into my first novel, When the Rainbow Goddess Wept. Learning about our Philippine epics also deepened my sense of identity. It gave me a greater understanding of who I was, am, and it grounded me to know I came from ancient people who had their own stories of gods and goddesses and magic and flight from oppression and so on. So Ralph's next question is, how autobiographical are the characters and the plots in your short fiction, especially the ones set in Ubek, Cebu, your hometown? The first answer that pops up in my head is, no, my stories are not autobiographical at all. I make a distinction between memoir and fiction. The truth is that many of my characters have been inspired by characters and events from Cebu, where I grew up in and which I visit regularly until the pandemic broke. I have to give you a background about my mythical place, Ubek. U-B-E-C. When I began writing stories, I used characters and real life situations from the Cebu of my youth. But I had such a difficult time writing because I, was, I felt compelled to tell the truth. One day when I was doodling, I reversed C-E-B-U into U-B-E-C. And I stared at those letters on that piece of paper and I fell in love with how it looked and how it sounded. I knew then that Ubek would be my mythical setting for my stories. I should, change, I should point out that this mythical setting may be something like Cebu, but I've changed it enough so Ubek is not Cebu. When I stumbled upon Ubek, my writing opened up. Suddenly, I could transform the real person said to have horns, there was a woman in Cebu who was said to have horns, into the sensual widow Agustina in one of my first short stories, Woman with Horns. Our cook Mengai became Laidan in my first novel, When the Rainbow Goddess Swept. The girl that I had been contributed to the characters of Remedios and Yvonne and Gemma in my stories. You will note that I refer to the transformation of the real life characters I had known and written about. When I'm working on fictional characters, even if inspired by people I knew, I flesh them out to find out what makes them tick, what is unique about them, what their deepest conflicts are. By the time I'm done with them, they are really no longer the person who had inspired me. Some aspects are retained, but they have been molded or fictionalized in order for me to be able to write their stories. There is another thing I want to mention about characters in my stories. While I sometimes create characters inspired by people whom I find interesting, there are occasions when these fictional characters come to me. They just come to me. They are not based on anyone I know or imagine. For instance, when I was writing Woman with Horns, specifically the funeral scene of the mayor's wife, I saw the following in my imagination. And here I quote from the story, near the hearse, an old man riding a horse stopped them. He was dressed in a revolutionary uniform with medals hanging on his chest and a gun in his right hand, which he fired once. Gasping, the mourners stopped still. The old man ordered the men to open the casket. He got off his horse, bent over the casket, and planted a kiss on the corpse's lips. Then he got back on his horse and galloped off. It happened just like that. So after finishing the story, Woman with Horns, I became obsessed with this old man. Who was he? 
you were a soldier and you had taken great risks to present yourself at the funeral of this woman during wartime. So clearly you loved her. As I tried to figure out who he was and what his conflicts and motivations were, I discovered his story, his point of greatest stress. And I was able to write The Black Man in the Forest. So in a nutshell, The Black Man in the Forest, which some people have told me is one of my best stories. It's a story of a hardened Filipino general who, while retreating with his men away from the American military in 1901 during the Philippine-American War, encounters and kills a Black American soldier. This event leads to his character change where he softens and becomes humanized. Another character who just popped up, who just appeared in my imagination was a young man in the story Casa Bonita. He was a young man who becomes obsessed with a beautiful wife of a wealthy man. His obsession leads him to committing murder. While I was working in the story, there was this murderer chatting in my head, which I found rather creepy. And fortunately, he went away after the story was written. I discovered I could even write from the point of view of a dog. If you will note in Romeo, um, you know, we're, we're in his point of view. The fact is, I can write about any character as long as I'm interested in that character, fascinated enough so that the character inhabits my mind as I try to figure out he, what he or she really is and what he, what his or her stories really are. So, Ralph's third question. How important is the setting, Ubek slash Cebu, Vegan, and Acapulco to your narratives? To me, setting is very important in storytelling. Setting is where my characters live and walk around in. It is where something happens to them externally as well as internally. My character settings influence their characters and their development, their character change. If there is World War II happening in Ubek, Cebu, my characters have to respond. In the case of When the Rainbow Goddess Wept, my characters evacuated me Bakwit, to Mindanao. The men had to fight. The women had to live simply. The little girl has to turn to the ancient epics to make sense out of the horrors of war. The young girl in the story Vegan moves in with her grandma into her grandmother's place after her mother is widowed. Her being in Vegan is an, is an important part of her story. Her isolation there, the antiquity of the place, her access to the Mankokulam Silvia are important aspects of the story. Her story would be entirely different if she had lived in California, for instance, instead of vegan. Likewise, the setting of Acapulco in the story Acapulco as Sunset is an integral part of the story. We have a Filipina wife and mother during the time of the galleon trade living in Acapulco, far away from her first home of Intramuros and her past, which she yearns for and her only link to this past is the Galeon. The story could not be set elsewhere. And her character and her, develop, her development would be different if Maria Soledad, the character in Acapulco at Sunset, lived elsewhere. I want to add one last thing about my, my stories that relate to character and setting. When I first started writing stories, I used Cebu Ubek primarily as my setting because this was familiar to me and because I wanted to explore it further in my imagination. But later on, I wrote stories set in other places, Manila, Vigan, California, Spain, Peru, India, France, anywhere, in fact. What was important to me was that I was interested in the characters and the situation. This ends part one of my talk. I will now answer Jack Quigley's questions. Hi, Jack. Thanks for the questions. So his first question is, 
You've written at least three novels and three short story collections. What was easier to write, a novel or a short story collection? And uh, uh, he also goes, what are the challenges of writing a novel, a short story collection? So the short answer is that a novel is far more difficult to write than a short story collection. Writing a novel is like really hard, Jack. It's a huge task, a major commitment that can take years. I'm referring to character-driven stories here. You hear of people writing for three, four, five, six, even 20 years uh, on their novels. And sometimes one can spend all that time only to discover it's unpublishable. A short story collection can be attacked bit by bit. I myself, I never really set out to write a collection, a short story collection. I write one short story at a time as the stories enter my head. And when I have a dozen or more, then I consider collecting them into a book. Some people say short story writing is like running a sprint while writing a novel is doing a marathon. I have to agree, this is true. Sometimes I can finish the draft of a short story in one sitting, but one rarely just dashes off a novel. For me, the challenge to write a novel came about after my first short story collection, Woman with Horns and Other Stories was published. I felt I could write short stories with some ease, and I wanted to prove to myself that I could write something long that was coherent. And so I started writing When the Rainbow Goddess Wept. It was originally known as Song of Yvonne. It took several years to write this novel. I do not write formula, so in many ways, the process of writing a novel, as far as I'm concerned, is hit and miss. It's a constant exploration in my head as to what the real story is. So in the case of When the Rainbow Goddess Wept or Song of Yvonne, the very first draft was about the time of my life when I was around nine years, nine years old. And that draft was filled with memories of my mother and me visiting her best friend who had a niece who was also my best friend all generally pleasant memories of my childhood and terribly boring. Nothing happened. There was no conflict, no drama in my draft. So I put aside a manuscript and I was just depressed for a while. But then one day we watched the movie Hope and Glory. I don't know if you know, you can probably kick that out still, Hope and Glory, about a little boy in London during World War II. And as I was watching that film, something clicked in my head. There was a connection between that story and mine. I looked at my original draft and discovered that my characters had been giving me broad hints as to what their real story was about. They always talked about the past about the war and what had happened to them. Do you remember when so-and-so was killed by the Japanese in Mindanao? I remember thinking, oh my God, is this wanting to be a war story? And I became frightened because there's a writing rule and you probably know it, uh, most writers do, write about what you know. I was born after the war, what did I know about it? But still, I could see that the characters were demanding that their real stories be told. Finally, I metaphorically rolled up my sleeves and began. And if it was going to be a war story, well, then so be it. I had to make changes. I had to put my characters back in time in 1941, and I stopped being me, but became Yvonne. I began right when the war broke, and like magic, the novel moved and the pages and chapters flowed. My other two novels were just as difficult to write. The process always felt sloppy, but also magical. The first draft at the novel Magdalena was slow and boring. Even I would get sleepy reading it. 
I decided to turn the chapters into short stories if I could to salvage what, what I could. I was doing that, cleaning up a chapter, cutting out what was unnecessary, getting to the core of things when I had an epiphany. The novel wanted that format. It wanted, it wanted those fragmented pieces in the book. So once again, I followed the story and put together the book, which is nonlinear and confuses some readers, but which is beloved by academics and poets. Same thing with my third novel, The Newspaper Widow. For this one, to write the draft, I joined the online NaNoWriMo novel writing program, wherein you write an average of 1,667 words a day with the goal of completing 50,000 words in a month. What happens if you want to meet the deadline is you stop thinking about the plot and so on, and you just madly try to reach the word count. In the end, I had 50,000 words off not a novel, but mishmash, but I had something to work on. That is where my third novel, The Newspaper Widow, came from. But it took several drafts and several years to get that work done. So yes, I have to say that writing a novel is far more difficult than writing short stories or putting together a short story collection. So here's Jack's second question. You have published your first book, Women with Horns and Other Stories, in 1987, when you were already approaching 40. Sorry for revealing your age. Is it wise for a writer to publish his or her work when he, she is already at a ripe age? What are the advantages and challenges of this? OK, Jack. So your question assumes, there's a kind of an assumption here that when one gets older, one might produce stronger works. I'm not really sure that age has very much to do with good writing. And here again, I refer to character driven stories. One needs to be clever at writing, at crafting stories, but more importantly, one needs good stories to tell. The first part being good at crafting stories is part gift and part learning. One can improve one's writing skills. The second part, having good stories, is dependent on how well a person can read the human heart. This is what I think. It sounds like a cliche, but it's true. The strength of fiction is dependent on the complexity of the characters. A shallow writer will tend to create shallow characters. A writer with depth, maturity, empathy has a better shot at creating deep, memorable characters. Again, I'll point out Madame Bovary by Flaubert, which could have been a cheap romance novel, but for the complex characters Flaubert created. I did not plan to hold off my writing career until I was older. My life, like my novel, seems to be nonlinear. That is, it's a bit unplanned, or more precisely, I would plan one thing, then end up doing something else. After high school, I wanted to be a civil engineer like my father. From St. Teresa's College, I went to engineering school at the UP. My where my father had been a professor there, engineering professor. He would have been embarrassed when I almost flunked math. I quickly transferred to Marinol to take up what seemed the easiest major, communication arts. After graduating from Marinol, I went on to UCLA to take up filmmaking, but discovered that making films is a terribly expensive as well as collaborative effort. And meantime, I became a wife and mother, and all these explain why it wasn't until the children were in school when I had the time and interest to take up fiction writing with some seriousness. So I don't think there are any advantages in waiting to get published until one is older. 
if you can get your one wonderful novel done when you are 23, as Carson McCullers did when she completed her novel, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, then go for it. Don't wait. So here's Jack's uh, third question. Why do you write and whom do you write for? So this, I find your question very profound. Why indeed do I write, struggle with the creation, deal with the difficulties of getting the work published? Why do I do all of this? To try and address that question, I have to go back to when I started writing. I remember when I was nine and my father died and in my childhood grief and missing him so much, I decided to write him letters. Letter writing was popular then, and we kept nice stationery at home, which I use, although I have no record of those letters now. But I remember making it a point to update him about my young life. That was when I started writing. A few years later, when I was already a teenager and in high school, my sister gave me a really pretty pink lock and key diary. Do you remember those? And I fell in love with writing in that diary, which I still have, by the way. I tried to write poetry and had some flowery writing in there. Most of my writings are whiny and dramatic and written in pretentious style, but I got hooked and continued my diary writing. So you know the rest of my journey. I went to engineering school, then film school, and then became a wife and mother before I started writing stories. There's the editing and publishing too, which I do, which are tied in with why I write. I write for several reasons. First, sometimes the characters or situations will just latch onto my brain and I must explore them and get them done in writing. Second obsession that I can't explain. Second, sometimes images and feelings need to be looked at and sorted out, memories for instance, and writing helps me do that. Third, I recognize that this ability to write is a gift from the creator, from God, and so I plod along. Fourth, and this is probably more true for the books I have edited, when I compare our Philippine or Filipino-American literature with Western lit, I can see that at times there are gaps in ours. It may be less so now, but decades ago, there were obvious gaps to me. That was what got me started editing anthologies such as Fiction by Filipinos in America and the more recent two volumes of Growing Up Filipino, which I did when I learned that there is a scarcity of such books. I'm currently working on Growing Up Filipino book three. So the question of whom do you write for is tricky to answer. Whom, whom do I write for? Because on the one hand, I am writing for the Filipino audience because I feel that my stories belong in the Philippines. But on the other hand, I'm writing in English because that is the best way I know how to write and also because I want my work to have a wider audience. I, I, I cannot really imagine writing in Cebuano. What are my chances of finding a literary agent? What are my chances of getting my work published in the US where I reside? It would be too complicated for me to have to get my work published in Cebu, then have the work translated into English to try and catch a wider audience. The fact also is that I have mastered the craft of writing fiction in English and to have to relearn doing this in Cebuano would be difficult. I will tell you a story of how during one of my visits to Cebu after years of exile here in the US during the Marcos years, I was with my nephews and nieces and we were speaking Cebuano and I said something that made everyone pause then laugh. I used a word that was no longer used. The word had become antiquated. The living language of Cebuano had moved on on, and I was stuck with words I had used decades ago. It was the weirdest feeling. 
Having said all that, I want to add that I have great admiration to those who write in Zambano or English or any other language vernacular. Many years ago, when I was in Spain representing the writers group Pan USA West, I met some Kurdish writers and I was impressed that they produced books in their language even when they did not have a physical country. They did not have their country then. This is very important work, which I admire greatly. I just unfortunately can't do it. I'm doing something, I'm good at doing something else. So um, I think I've answered your questions, Jack, and I've answered Ralph. And um, uh, with that, I will end my talk. You can find me on social media and my official website, ceciliabrainer.com. And um, don't forget, that uh, my short story collection, uh, selected short stories is out and available. I believe you can find this in Lazada and Shopee. And it really makes uh, very good uh, gifts for the holidays too. So think about it and um, I'm sure you'll enjoy the stories. So I want to thank Jing, Ralph, Jack, all of you, the audience, once again, and I wish you all to keep safe and my very best and warm wishes. Thank you very much. Bye.